Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alberto Vargas. I'm the Associate Director of LACID, the Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies Program. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our lecture series and to introduce our distinguished panel today. Uh, the uh, theme today is this collaboration between uh, Wisconsin and Colombia the University of Wisconsin in Madison and the Universidad Nacional de Colombia in this uh, project called One Health. Uh, you can read the bios of our, our three panelists, the extensive bios in our website. I'll just do a brief introduction to take advantage of the time that we have. Uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat and at the end of the, of the presentation, please fill out the evaluation and the, and the questionnaire form. So we have today the two co-directors of the Colombia Wisconsin One Health Consortium, Professor Jorge Osorio, uh, who's a full professor here in the School of Veterinary Medicine, the Department of Pathobiological Sciences, and uh, Juan Pablo Hernandez Ortiz is also a, a full professor in the Department of Materials and Nanotechnology at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. They both of them are joining us from Medellin in, in uh, Colombia. Uh, we also have with us Leonor Hidalgo Ciro, who until recently she was a member of the Ruta N Corporation in the city of Medellin. Uh, right now, she's a Fulbright Fellow at the Special Program for Urban and Regional Planning at the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology. And she is also, we're very proud, she's a um, uh, LASI's uh, Honorary Fellow uh, in this term. So without uh, further ado, I'll pass the floor to Jorge Osorio, who is going to moderate and coordinate the panel presentation. Jorge, go ahead. Um, Alberto, thank you so much, and uh, I want to thank um, LACES for the opportunity to, to be here with uh, this seminar, and also the audience, you know, some of my former mentor professors, Professor Tom Yule is right here with us, Bruce Christensen, who has been very involved with us, also in Colombia, and also I want to thank, you know, the group that we put together, Leonor Hidalgo is, um, has been very instrumental working with us in this project, she is um, degree in law and uh, now she was working before in Ruta N Corporation. You're gonna hear all about Ruta N. Now she has a very exciting project and it's going to be in Madison uh, later this semester to work with us with LACES. And also Juan Pablo Hernandez. Uh, Juan Pablo, uh, very familiar to Madison. Juan Pablo uh, Hernandez is a um, me uh, mechanical engineer, but did his training PhD in UW Madison, then continued with his postdoc um, in Madison as well, working with uh, David Schwartz, and been very instrumental in getting this um, nice project going on the collaboration that we're going to have. So, um, to start. Sorry, Jorge, you are mute. Thanks. Um, so the concept of One Health, thanks for the, the concept of One Health that um, might be not very familiar to this audience. It has been around for a long time, but this concept basically implies that the solutions to uh, many aspects in, in, in our society are derived from interaction between different disciplines that involve animal, humans, and the environment. So the way that we solve this problem is by working together either in biology, ecology, air sciences, engineering, social sciences, human and veterinary medicine. So that's how we solve the problems. So this concept actually has been around for a long time and it's nothing new. And in fact, some of the original roots of One Health come from Wisconsin. Professor Aldo Leopold, uh, who is very not known in our environment in, in different uh, schools of, of ecology and wildlife, wildlife diseases, mentioned in the past that, you know, that the control of diseases was actually a matter of controlling the environment and not the animal. So that's why it was extremely important to do that. Um, and also that conservation is a state between, a harmony between the men and land. So teaching us that we should, we should uh, learn to uh, 
be in, in very good balance between um, men and, 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 and the land and the use of the land. And now as we move around the world, we can see that we are in a global economy. So a global economy also means that we are part of a global diseases um, concept. Because we can travel, separately in the last year, but we could travel through many different places around the world. And that means that easily pathogens that are either in Asia or in Africa or somewhere else can come to other places. And here we have a list of many infectious diseases that actually have, you know, came up to be a major emerging disease in the last 20, 30 years. And some of these names are obviously going to look very familiar to you. Ebola is very common, you know, we have here that in Africa. Uh, avian influenza has been very common. And in the Americas in the last five, 10 years, we heard chikungunya coming, Zika, and more recently, we have the coronavirus pandemic. So now that we speak, we know that we're in a, in a pandemic situation right now. We have more than uh, 2.5 million deaths around the world, with many countries still suffering from the pandemic. And we see the pandemic is not, well, we think that it's getting better with the vaccines. The, the vaccines hopefully are providing some support to the pandemic, but also we know that many Latin American countries and African countries might not be the, the first ones in the list of priorities for the vaccination. So we feel like the uh, pandemic also is still like to, will continue for a while. So the question is also, how do we think about the next pandemic? And how do we prevent the next pandemic? So this map shows what we, we call the, the hotspots of infectious diseases. And it's no surprise that you can see here in red that these areas like in India, in China, in Africa, are also very hot spots where disease can emerge. And that has been the history that we have seen that happen. But also in that map, we see, um, we see Colombia, and the area in South America in Colombia, where we see basically a really hot spot for infectious diseases that can, that can come. Same thing happens if we look for zoonotic diseases because we know that 60% of the human pathogens come from animals. So when we look at um, zoonotic diseases, we can also see that the area around Colombia can be a significant problem. So what that has been my drive to focus some of my research on campus in focusing emerging diseases in Colombia in the region. So with that, I'd like to focus a little more about Colombia, just to, for those of you that are not familiar with Colombia. So Colombia is in the northern corner of South America, has five countries that are the neighboring countries. Some of them are, you know, very familiar to you. And some of them have actually significant social and economical issues. We hear all about the the migration of uh, uh, Venezuelans into Colombia, or they're basically struggling in different places. Same thing happens sometimes in Ecuador. But also Colombia has these two interesting borders, one with Panama, where we have the Guardian Dab, and also the Amazon River, where we have the Amazon River. And these are uh, you know, home to very significant, very important um, indigenous populations that are highly vulnerable and susceptible to many infections. In addition to that, Colombia is a very large biodiverse country. It raised one of the two, three in the, country, in the world in terms of biodiversity. And that brings a very interesting mixture where we have uh, wildlife, we have animals, we have humans, we have ecology factors being involved. And that's why it, pro it provides the opportunity for emerging infectious diseases. So in addition to that, there is some migratory routes that come from different countries around the world. And they come trying to find their way through the U.S. and somehow they end up in Colombia. And many times they end up in, a, in the Garien Dab where they stop for a while, trying to wait for their way to go, to go through the U.S., to get through the U.S. And this is the list of pathogens that can be brought into this area. So it's not strange to think that we could have Ebola in Latin America at some point, okay? So that could be the issue. So, in terms of infectious diseases, uh, there is Professor Tom Yu. Colombia has been working in, the UW Madison has been working in Colombia for a long time. Um, Tom Yu basically uh, developed his program from 19, starting 1968. And there are stories that actually Tom has a pilot license and flew to Colombia with his plane full of supplies. I don't know how many, if he had any custom permits or uh, aduana permits to get to customs. But I heard stories about, it. I don't want to know that many details of what he brought or he got out of, of there sometime. But I hear always stories of Tom traveling to Colombia, motivating students to go to do research. I was one of Tom's students that was really motivated when I saw him coming 
um, as a good gringo with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of other professors coming and doing some really cool projects. So that motivated me to, to do my uh, master's and my PhD at University of Wisconsin. So I came to Madison in 2004 and I started continuing with the commerce program. And I initially worked with the University of Antioquia in, in Medellin and then continued there in about 2015 when I had the great opportunity to work with Leonor. And we started basically doing a great collaboration with Rutan and UW Madison. And then um, in 2018, uh, we did a collaboration with Rutaen, Universidad Nacional, and University of Wisconsin. 2015, I had Professor um, Bruce Christensen, who is shown here, that came with me to Colombia, and he got really excited about working in Colombia, so he actually could tell you that um, the only risk of Colombia is that you might like it. So with that, so what I like to do is just end up showing the images of Medellin, you know, as a city of uh, different constructs that we're gonna hear from Leonor, a city that has transformed itself to show different views. And then um, Leonor is gonna tell us how Medellin has been able to go to innovation and, and social development to, to be the city that is today. Um, I'm going to pull Leonor right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge, and thank you, Alberto, for giving us the opportunity to share this experience with the LASIS community and all of the people who are here, here with us. Um, innovation and social transformation in Medellin came together. So that's why I'm going to explain uh, about the social and, uh, social and urban transformation and the strategy about science, technology, and innovation. But uh, before to start to talking about that, I think it's very important to make a quick reminder about how was our social situation before these, those strategies uh, were implemented. And first of all, because I think it's uh, good to be honest about that, and also because the city feels uh, very proud about the progress that the society has been doing for so many years. Uh, next, please, Jorge. Yes, as probably most of you know, uh, 30 years ago, Medellin was uh, Medellin faced uh, serious uh, social challenges and violence problems, most of them related with the drug business and the cartels, and also because of the lack of, of, of opportunities that we had at that time in our city. Uh, next, please. At, in 1991, uh, Medellin hit the rock bottom and became the most violent city in the world. So uh, no other city in the history had reached the number of murders that we uh, sadly, sadly reached at that time. It was so awful for us as a society. Uh, it was painful, sadness. Uh, you can see that picture is a real picture of the things that uh, were happening at that time. But uh, next please, Jorge. Fortunately, uh, things started to change and there were some important aspects, as I told you earlier. And uh, one of the aspects is social and urban inclusion uh, processes. Uh, in that topic, I will uh, show you some of the most significant examples about the kind of intervention that we did in the city. Next, please, Jorge. Mobility, uh, it was a very important issue for us. Uh, Medellin is located in a valley and we have some uh, neighborhoods and some settlements in the hills. And those neighborhoods were not able to connect with the city. They were as isolated because uh, they were not a uh, public transportation uh, for them. So the city uh, implement this solution that you can see in the pictures, so those kind of, of gondols that you are probably familiar with. And after that, the, uh, the community were able to connect with the public uh, transportation system, and that's allowed them to uh, get access to the uh, healthcare, public health care system, uh, public schools, and things uh, basic like uh, go uh, to the city for looking a job or work every day. So, in that way, uh, the the uh, city stopped that as isolation. Next, please. 
And this is another remarkable example about the kind of intervention that the city uh, did, uh, the city implement in, in some of the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods was very affected uh, because of the violence and also because, of, uh, because it's a very poor uh, neighborhood. And the people there, more um, like uh, two, 12,000 people had to take stairs to access the, their houses. Uh, their stairs were equivalent to 28 uh, levels of stairs. So uh, after the city uh, put these uh, giant mechanical escalators, uh, people just spend uh, six minutes trip to go to their houses. So it, uh, it, has a, it had a very good uh, and positive impact in the quality of life of that community. Next, please. This is another example, it's not related with mobility, but for me it's, very, it's the most lovely example about the power of transform that the Medellin has. And uh, it's about the uh, garbage dump that we had in the middle of the city. And that garbage uh, used to be the home for uh, 2,000 families who used to live there in misery conditions. And, but uh, for, through many years working together, I mean, the, the community and the government, uh, they came up, came up with a solution. Uh, and now, next please, Jorge, that, uh, that garbage uh, became a beautiful garden. We call it the environment for life because uh, people who live there now is uh, relocated. And some of them who want to come back to the place, they are working there as uh, taking care of the, gar uh, the garden. Um, next, please. Uh, for those kind of uh, strategies or those kind of interventions, uh, Medellin uh, was awarded as the most innovative city in 2013 and Medellin won and, and other prizes, but this is very important and it's very significant because uh, it, puts, it puts in the mindset of our citizens the importance between and the link between innovation and social transformation. Next, please. The other uh, key aspect that I want to talk about is science, technology, and innovation strategy and the role that Rutan uh, played on that. Next, please. Uh, Medellin had a very uh, strong network between uh, private sector, academy, and government. And they are uh, working together for a long time. And in 2003, uh, they established the Comité Universidad Empresa Estado, which is a committee when uh, the most uh, influence uh, companies from the private sector and the most prestigious uh, universities of the city and representatives from the government work together uh, looking to improve the performance of our uh, innovation ecosystem in the city. And as a result of those uh, of this uh, work together, uh, next please Jorge. In, in 2009, uh, Ruta N was born as the business and Innovation Center for Medellin. And I just uh, want to show this picture because uh, in that place, in that building, uh, there are the, the headquarters of Rutan, but also it, uh, there was located the first laboratory that Wisconsin University and Rutan uh, established there. Next, please, Jorge. Which is the purpose of Rutan? Uh, Rutan has the mission, the main purpose of transforming Medellin's economy from traditional economy to knowledge economy. Next. And what does it mean? It means uh, that Ruta NA is working in three, uh, in three aspects. First is uh, they work for create more jobs because more jobs uh, imply more opportunities for, especially for young people. So they were not available for enrolling the illegal business or informal economy. Uh, the second one is uh, better paid. I mean, those positions should be better paid because uh, they are related with the software sector and that market is able to pay more uh, for those positions. And uh, the, uh, the third aspect is uh, related with a uh, better quality of life. 
and that has two, uh, two ways to, to understand. Uh, in one hand, is because with, uh, in Rutaene, uh, Rutaene things, if the, there are more opportunities and more jobs and there are more uh, income in the families, probably the quality of life uh, will improve. And also in the perspective of the Rutaene, uh, is trying to solve some uh, challenges, cities challenges. Next, please. And to, to reach those goals, uh, there is a roadmap for 10 years since 2011 until 2021. And it's called the Science, Technology and Innovation Plan, which is a public policy. And it was uh, focused on three areas, energy, ICT and health. And, and this last one, I mean health, plus the focus of a, a, cha a sol a city challenges is how the alliance between a University of Wisconsin and Rutan came. Next, please. As uh, Jorge told you, in 2015, uh, Ruta N and uh, University of Wisconsin signed a uh, cooperation agreement uh, looking for create a center of excellence. And but by that time, we start the first uh, studies in infectious diseases like dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and influenza. But it was just the beginning, but because later and uh, more uh, other players join us in this purpose. And I think that's the story that Juan Pablo is going to tell you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, Leonor. So now I would like to introduce um, Juan Pablo Hernandez. As I mentioned, Juan Pablo is a mechanical engineer from the University of Nacional. He has been is a Wisconsin, 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 right? Um, went to Madison Balagoka, he's a PhD and has been very involved in Wisconsin. And now he's going to tell you the second part of the story, how Rutan, Wisconsin, and Na University Nacional got together to develop the uh, Columbia Wisconsin 100 Consortium and the impact that that's having, in, in, especially now in the time of the pandemic. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Alberto, and uh, everybody in Laces for the invitation. It's always amazing to to give a talk in your in your own school. I mean, uh, Madison is as much you Jorge mentioned is is my second city uh, by heart. I I live almost ten years in Madison, and and I really really enjoy living there, and I enjoy every time I go to to Wisconsin. So there's a couple of things, couple of fronts that I want to cover today. I want to to share, of course, we need to talk about SARS-CoV-2. We need to talk about the pandemic because it's what everybody's talking about and because this is something that put challenges in everybody, including Colombia. Um, I want to focus a little bit in the biology or, or, and the epidemiology, and I want to actually try to highlight a lot of the social aspects that we face as Colombians and, um, and the lessons that we learn, uh, that are a lot of them are positive lessons, and some of them are not that positive. And, uh, and to not be super intense with COVID, at the end, I want to talk about dengue and uh, fe uh, like uh, fever diseases uh, because we have a lot of them. And, and what are the challenges that we need to face when we want to, uh, to establish platforms to, to attend the health status of, of everybody in Colombia and in the region. So before I continue, I, I, I'm, I'm just here, I'm the face, but I'm, I, I don't do this by myself. Uh, as usual, the students, the scientists, uh, and the professors that work with us are the ones that do the hard work. So I want to I want to highlight that the One Health Consortium that we started like three or four years ago, um, and we established at the University Nacional two years ago when we opened officially the Genomic Laboratory, now has grown, and we have more than about 40 students. Uh, we have uh, professors all over the place in Wisconsin, in Chicago at the Universidad Nacional and Northwestern that work with us. And uh, most important, I have, to, uh, I have to thank and I have to acknowledge the people and the foundation that are responsible for all the funding that we receive, including foundations in Colombia, uh, the Ministry of, of Science and, and Education in Colombia, and NIH, our and the Global Health Institute. 
which is also one of our sponsors. Um, so Jorge mentioned this, and I just want to highlight a couple of the, the premises and the, and the fundamentals that we cover in One Health. What we want is to, to merge all disciplines in this concept of One Health, where we have to face the realities of health uh, uh, with the animals, with the environment, and with humans. And in particular, we selected elements uh, that are uh, personalized precision medicine, population genomics, molecular engineering and design, viral evolution and favorable, uh, favorable disease X, and to be able to do local diagnostics as our tool to face these challenges. Uh, the motivation, of course, is because it's very important to identify this, uh, the, what pathogens and what are the diseases that are circulating in our, in our regions. Um, more importantly, we need to characterize those pathogens. And nowadays, every characterization is, of course, based in genomic analysis and sequence information. And this is because we want to have a risk management of the, possibly, the, po the possible zoonotic effects that we're going to have in Colombia and in the region. And you know, Jorge mentioned and showed you how Colombia is an almost mandatory path for migration. So if we don't control, we don't know, if we don't if we don't have a platform to identify the possible threats of zoonotic events, this can be, uh, again, uh, a global hazard. So fundamentally, everything that happened in, in Wuhan, China, uh, one year ago, it can happen also in Colombia. And we have all the elements that can merge that situation. We have different regions, different weather, different environment. We have a lot of migration. We have people that move around the country and we have migration of, of birds, we have migration of other species, we have all the febrile diseases that you can imagine, arborvirosis, malaria, gastrointestinal diseases, so those that can happen. So, so that's why we want to be very careful and control this in the country. Um, one, of the, one of the big challenges that we have in South America, including Colombia, is that we do not have independence uh, in the production of biologicals, and One Health is one of the strategies that we are using to convince the government and the local companies because we need to be independent. We need to produce vaccines, we need to produce uh, treatments, we need to produce pros, uh, molecules, because right now we depend anything on, on, on abroad. So, so let, me, let me just go to this. So a couple of fundamentals of Colombia, and this is because I want to highlight a couple of social social elements that are important when we, we, we face uh, COVID-19. The first thing is that we have 50 million inhabitants. Uh, we are a centralized government. So we, we, we do not have a state in the United States. We have a central government. And uh, the, the capital is Bogota, which is our biggest city. And the territory is divided in departamentos, uh, something similar to the states, but they're not, they, they have some independence in some measurements, but they always depend on the central government. The departamentos have a capital, which typically is the biggest city of the departamentos. For instance, in Antioquia, the biggest city is Medellin, as Leonor was, was showing you. So Medellin is the capital of Antioquia. Uh, the biggest city by order are Bogotá, Medellin, Cali, Barranquilla, Cartagena, and Pereira. Um, we have an universal headquarters. Uh, it's a little bit different than the United States. So it's by law, it's, a, it's mandatory by constitution and by law. Uh, that covers can be of two types, contributed when you work. So when you work, you and your entire family is covered by your, by your employee and by you. And the other one, if you don't have a job, if you are an immigrant, for example, or if you are poor and you have no conditions to have a job, then the government uh, install you in something that is called socialized the regime, where the government pays for everything for you. And unemployment is normally around 10%. And right now, after the pandemic, some cities actually increase the number, 15 to 17%. But normally, we are around 10%. But we have a huge level of informality. Informality around Colombia is almost 40%. Informality means that you work, but you don't have social security. So you work in a, like in a, in a hair salon, or you work as a construction worker. And then you work by the day, or you work by the week. And, and there, is, there is a way of, of, because there is a subsidized regime, so then these people have health coverage, but then they, are not, they don't have contributed health coverage. Um, 
And in general, we have a huge, huge problem of centralism. So Colombia is, uh, Bogota controls everything and is super centralized, but also the departamentos, everything is on the cities. So the resources, hospitals, doctors, research, technology, uh, good health coverage, uh, good uh, utilities are extremely well done in the cities, but in the regions that are far away from the cities, not as good. So everything is very central, and that's a big, big problem. And, um, and that centralism correlates, unfortunately, with the regions that are hyper-endemic for a lot of the infectious diseases. So the um, Amazon jungle, the Orinoquia, the far Pacific, the upper North Coast, all the super high endemic regions are far away from the cities. So it's not the same to have malaria, let's say close to Medellin, to have malaria in the middle of the Amazon jungle because the resources are completely different. So those are challenges. And in the pandemic, we really, really suffered this. However, I want to highlight a couple of things that will be amazing. So pre-COVID, Colombia had a handful of laboratories able to do a PCR diagnostics. The first thing one year ago is we did a super big effort and we established a network of 167 laboratories all across the country. Everybody working together, everybody recognizing the limitation, everybody knowing that this was a serious situation and we needed diagnostics to at least know the average, the average rate of infection in the country. And we passed from 3,000 PCRs a day to more than 83,000 PCRs a day. And we did this in a couple of months. The second thing we did is at the beginning, before the pandemic, the genomic surveillance was at least 100, 150 sequences a day. Nowadays, we can do more than 1,000 sequences a week. And um, the, case, uh, the, the intensive care units, which we know is a, a, a super huge element to treat COVID, I mean, it's the only thing we have to treat co uh, like critical COVID, we also did a huge effort and we increased more than 91% the units in the country. Now we have more than 10,000 10, units in the country. So I wanted to show you this because the, the, the pandemic in Colombia taught a huge lesson to everybody in Colombia. When we, we faced a lot of problems in the past, as Leonor was mentioning, we had the, the narco, narco guerrilla terrorism, we have the violence, all the stuff. And somehow the Colombians always we thought that everything was in different fronts. The universities were fighting a different front, that the government and the companies were trying to make an effort. But here, this is a mancommunal effort. Everybody working together. Universities, private and public, the government and companies. And this is a huge lesson. And I am actually very proud of saying this because, because we actually thought that we were not going to be able to do it. And we did. And we were able to work together towards a purpose. And, and these are just three of the results that are, are worth to mention, but there are much more, right? And uh, Leonor can mention how we actually did our own uh, respirators for IC units from zero, from scratch. Uh, companies, universities, government work together. They put a lot of initiatives. We have treatment going on. We have a lot of stuff that we, we're doing together. Now, I want to, I want to show you, um, I want to just go directly into, into One Health in, in what we did. So first of all, we are part of the, of the network from diagnostics. We, we were uh, part of the, of the network from almost day one. Our lab was certified to do PCR diagnostics and uh, we were almost ready because of, of the discipline and everything that we transfer from Wisconsin to Colombia. Our lab is BSL2. Uh, we, we copy the regulations of the University of Colombia. We did We follow the regulation, we follow the instrumentation, so we were ready. So we started doing support to the Colombian government. And uh, we did more than 
Then let me just try to mute. Is someone just to mute? Yeah, let me just try to. Okay. So we we actually um, we did we 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 decided not to go into the services. So we decided that as Universidad Nacional and Ruta N and University of Wisconsin, we decided that we were not going to provide services because we were able actually to charge for the diagnostics. Uh, instead, we, we, we started a, a, a relationship with ESA, which is the Interconnection Electrical Company of Colombia, and they gave us enough money to buy 100,000 uh, PCR diagnostic kits, and also to, to hire more people to do diagnostics. So what we did is, we decided that we were going to do a free service uh, to the informals, 40% of the country, to immigrants, including like 1.5 million Venezuelans that we have right now in Colombia. And all these communities that were at risk, far away, and they didn't have the means to have PCR testing. So in total, we did more than 8,000 uh, free PCR diagnostics in 22 different municipalities across the country. Now, more important than this, and from the from the epidemiological point of view and from the diagnostic point of view this was very important but more important is that we were going directly to the communities to give the correct message behind behind the, the pandemic so here as in the rest of the world in the united states and in other parts people were like were believing more the social networks the the whatsapp messages the fake news about covid and the reality of the COVID. So there was a lot of myths in the regions. Uh, if, you, if you get a PCR test, they, they infect you. If you die, they pay money to the mayor. Uh, so don't do this. Uh, it's a lie. Uh, there is no virus. The virus is a myth. It's, it's because they want to control you. Uh, so we actually established our education program going to, the, to this region. And I, I want to show you couple of pictures. We had to use helicopter. We have to use small planes, big planes. We have to go in a small boats. Um, and while we went, we went to the real, real faraway regions to attend these people and to bring the message of the reality of the, of the COVID. To use the, the paocas, to use the face masks, to use, wash your hands, to be socially distanced, to do, please do not do parties. In the, follow the, the mandatory quarantine. I mean, we understand that the for, for the informals, it's very hard to follow and to enforce the quarantine because they have to go out to work because that's how they do. They live on a daily basis. But then if you're going to go out and work, then wash your hand, put the face mask. I mean, just be social distance. I mean, this, is, this was actually the most important thing for us. And, and this is the thing that I am the most proud of my group. We, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, one health was almost 65 people. 65 people going to all this region, and this is an exhausting job. You can imagine how hard it is to wear the, uh, the, the personal protection equ uh, equipment in Leticia at 40 Celsius degrees for eight hours. So everybody, uh, this, is, this was unbelievable, and this is one of the things that we are very proud of. And everybody at the University of Wisconsin should be very proud because this is actually part of your work and part of everything, everything that we do together. So at the end, we, 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 we supported the Departamento de Antioquia. We also supported the Departamento de Nariño, which is at the south in the Pacific coast. They had huge problem of diagnostics and they had outbreaks at the beginning of the pandemic where it's like entire towns of more than 25,000 people were completely, completely infected. So we, we went there directly to try to help and to give a hand on this. On this. And we established our own strategies to do PCR testing. And, uh, and I'm going to mention one. Uh, but with Ruta N, these 100,000 diagnostics that we got from Grupo ISA, we, we, we didn't keep them all. I mean, we say, well, it's not worth it to keep them all. I mean, we need to, to put them in the country. So we actually did collaboration with other labs in different parts of the country. And we submitted for free these kits. We included like the, 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 the swab to do the, to do the test, the extraction kit for the RNA, and the PCR kit to do the molecular diagnostics. Um, in addition, we, we were part of, of the huge uh, zero prevalence study uh, in the country. I'm going to also mention a couple of things. So, so, so let's, let's continue with, with this. So 
One of the, our own strategies, which was actually very important, and we are also very happy and very proud of the results, is that we established a surveillance in health workers in four hospitals in, in the metropolitan area of, of the Valle Aurra, which includes Medellin. So what we did is we follow, and we're still following them, we, we follow 10% uh, of, the, of, the, of the workers randomly per week, and we've been following them for more than 27 weeks now, where we actually do PCR and now we do ELISA, we do serological measurement of antibodies. So if you guys remember when we started the pandemic, one of the red hot, hot spots for the, for the infections were, were the hospitals. Because of course, if you're sick, you go to the hospital, they do testing, and we didn't know what we were dealing with. So at the beginning, the, the hospital became the red spot. So, there was a lot, of, a lot of news and a lot of pressure on people. If you're sick, I mean, only if you are super critical, go to the hospital. And there were myth around the city that if you go to the hospital, you're going to get infected. So we did this after the government enforced biosecurity protocols in all the hospitals. And what we showed, uh, doing more than 7,000 PCR tests, is that the hospitals are not hot spots anymore. If the hospitals follow the biosecurity protocols, there is no risk to be infected in a hospital. So the, the positivity along 27 weeks was 4% in, in the workers. The positivity in the, in the city has been from, from May to right now, 25%. And not only we were able to detect that there is, the, 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 there is no hotspot, but we actually were able to correlate that the infected, the positive workers were actually being infected in their communities, in their neighborhoods. They were not being infected in the hospital. And we, we found this because we, we follow, and uh, we did a color map and we follow the positive patients and where they are. And we were able to correlate that the neighborhoods of the city of Medellin that were hot spots for infections were actually where these workers were living and they were going to the hospitals. But more importantly, even if they go positive, if they, even if they're positive in the hospital, if they use the biosecurity, they don't infect the other people. So we actually correlate everything. We have all the correlations, but this is a, a very important thing, a, a very important measure worldwide, because if you follow biosecurity, even in hospitals, you don't get infected. So that's, uh, uh, we need to keep using the tapawakas and, and the face masks, and we need to keep using this until we, um, until we do vaccinate everybody. Um, the other study, as I mentioned, is that we, we did a, a study with the National Institute of Health in Colombia where we measure blood from 17,000 participants in 10 different cities. Uh, we measured this from September to December last year. Uh, One Health in particular was in charge of Leticia, Villavicencio, and Medellin. But at the end, we had to help also in Barranquilla, Ipiales, Guapi. Uh, and Cali. Uh, we have personnel, we have the support for the, for the private sector, so we actually submitted our personnel there to help the, the National Institute of Health doing this. A couple of things that I want to highlight is that Colombia, similar to other countries in South America, are super highly, zero, the zero conversion rates are high, are super high. The average zero conversion rate in December in Colombia was close to 30%, which is uh, different than Europe and United States where the zero conversion rates were lower. And, and, and this, and the reason that we have even, we have cities with 60% zero conversion. So zero conversion means that 60% of people were infected before, our, uh, before we went there. And the reason of this is because of the informality, because all these informals were unable to follow the strict uh, quarantine protocol because they have to go out to work and eat. So that high mobility that was conserved in some, in some cities and in some sectors of the cities allow high infection rates. Our lethality is lower because we are younger. We have a, a younger population than other countries compared to the United States or to Europe. So that's why we, our statistics of lethality are, are the same the, by, by age group. But because we're younger, we have less. So, so uh, the final thing is we, as everybody, we have to do a genome surveillance. Um, we have these variants of interest that are South Africa, Brazil, uh, UK, and California. 
Uh, and what we do in the lab, uh, also in the hand of the National Institute of Health, is we, we receive between 100 and 200 uh, samples every week. We, we sequence them and we do all the analysis to characterize and to detect what are the variations that these uh, bi circulating viruses we have. And then we do a map and, uh, in, together in collaboration with the National Institute of Health. Um, here uh, we, we have like in red, I marked like a variation of interest because the, the mutations are converging to these hyper contagious mutations and uh, that the only one that we have present in Colombia at the moment is the Brazilian one, but we all only have that in the Amazon, in the Department of, of Amazons. For that reason, actually, the Amazon Department is closed. So there are no flights between the center of the country to, to, to Leticia right now because of the presence of the Brazilian variant. So the conclusions that I want to highlight in this is that the pandemic uh, highlighted uh, all the deficiencies that we have in the regions in Colombia, which poses COVID-19 as a pandemic, not as a pandemic, right? Um, however, working together, we show that we can do very nice results, effective results, and our infection rates, our, our uh, unfortunate uh, deaths by COVID are lower than many other countries in the region. Um, if you follow biosecurity protocols, uh, the infection rate goes down. Uh, we, we, we had a major player, which is the informality. Informality play a major rate, uh, was a major player in this mobility in the cities, even in the strict quarantine. I mean, if you are an informal worker that, that have to go out and work to have food for your family, even in the, in the quarantine, you go out and work and the police was, were not going to tell you anything. I mean, the police officer were like, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course you have to go and work. I mean, don't worry. Uh, so, so that actually resulted in a high seroconversion, high infection rate in, in our country and, um, and in, in several waves during, during the, the, the dynamics of the, of, the, of the pandemic. And finally, going to the regions was very important for us for the, for the biological and epidemiological point of view but it was actually more important from the social point of view. Uh, yeah, I mean, we had to go and, and do this mythification of the, of the pandemic. We, you, you can imagine, we went to Nekokli, which is a, a town in the north of Antioquia. Uh, it was a super high lethality rate in, in a couple of in, in two weeks. We went and we had to actually sit down and convince like uh, persons older than 85 with a saturation rate of 65% to go to the hospital. So they didn't want to go to the hospital. Well, you have to go to the, I mean, we will actually take you there. So, so the, the mitification was, was actually very, very, very bad. So Alberto, I think uh, uh, we, we can talk about dengue another time. I think we, we, are, we are good and we are happy to answer questions. And, uh, and of course, everybody is welcome to Colombia after the vaccination. Um, and uh, One Health is part of Wisconsin, is part of the university. And, and if anybody has interest to, to join us, to do projects, to come to Leticia, to Orinoquia, to follow closely what we do, and, and not only the, from the engineering, biological, but also from the social point of view, everybody's welcome because One Health is part of Wisconsin.